I'm sure there are some of you who won't need a lot of supplemental material, um, and that's perfectly fine. You know, you might not need these lectures, but I know some people do need that supplement. They need like the visual and the auditory aspects together. So I'm doing these videos similar to how I would teach in class. And hopefully that will make it a little easier for you guys to feel comfortable with the material because it is a lot in a very short amount of time. So, um, the first video that I'm doing now is going to be for the course introduction. So it's going to talk about the syllabus, what we're doing for the semester, what is expected of you guys, what's expected for me to like do for you guys as well, and just what we're looking to accomplish over the next eight weeks. So that'll be this first video. So, which is usually like what I do for the first class. I do like course introduction, I introduce myself, and then when we're face to face, I usually ask the students to do an introduction. So since you guys chose online, you get to like skip that part. Um, I know a lot of teachers will do like a like a student introduction discussion board, but I feel like I'm already throwing quite a lot of you guys for the first week. So I decided to not do that. Um, so hopefully that'll be like one less thing you have to worry and stress about. So let's dive right in. I'm going to share my screen with you guys so that way you can um, see the syllabus, which has been uploaded in several places. So hopefully you guys are seeing a PDF file pull up for um, for the syllabus for this class. I also emailed it to you guys in the welcome email I sent out um, the other night on Friday. And I so I have it there in an attachment. I also have it on the um, home page at the top is the syllabus. It's also listed under announcements, which I have like a shortened version of the welcome email. Um, and I have the syllabus there as well. So there are multiple places you guys can get it. Um, some people may want to print it and that's perfectly fine. So that way you can go back and reference it. I know when I took online classes as a student, I would print like the materials and like make myself a binder just as if I were physically going to class. It just helped me to keep it all organized. Um, not the best option to save the trees, but, um, but for me, I like I needed that like hands on, you know, like right in front of me instead of going back and forth with electronic documents. So for those of you who do better with like a binder, that might be a good option for you. And for those of you who don't, that's fantastic. Um, this will be a good reference for you to go back and forth um, because sometimes Canvas gets a little overwhelming because there's just a lot of options, especially if you're doing multiple classes. Every teacher is a little bit different. Um, the social sciences division, which this class is based under in the political science department, we all have like the same formatting. Like you'll notice if you take another class under social sciences later on, or if you're taking one now, like say you're taking psychology and you're also taking American government, you'll see that it's laid out very similarly. I can't speak to, you know, like the English department or any of the other, you know, like the math or science or anything, um, because I'm not sure if it's like a department thing that we did under social sciences, or if it's like a college wide trying to streamline the process for the students. So, but I know for social sciences division that we kind of have it all laid out the same to try and make it a little easier, but Canvas in general can still be pretty overwhelming. And I'll walk you guys through some basics tonight on like where to find stuff in Canvas as well. So, but we'll start out with the syllabus for now and we'll just go over the basics. So again, we are taking POS 2041-51826 as an online class, American National Government. I am your instructor, Lisa Nixon Mabry. Um, this is a syllabus. You're here for the E session of the summer semester for 2022 with Gulf Coast State College. The term is from June 13th through August 5th. You guys will notice that um, if you look at the details on Canvas, it on in our class, it says the 10th. I did that to go ahead and open up stuff for you guys to see this weekend, 
for the overachievers who are like, I don't want to wait until Monday. I want to like go ahead and start knocking stuff out. So that way you had access to things if you so chose. But the semester doesn't officially start until tomorrow on Monday, June 13th. So don't worry, don't stress out. Nothing was due this weekend because technically the semester hasn't even started yet. I just wanted to give you guys a few days with the material before you had to dive right in. So it is an eight week class. Um, we have quite a hefty book to get through in that time frame. So like I said in the email, the first week is pretty hectic and I'm sorry for that, but I do set up my class to where it's busier in the beginning and then hopefully like it, the students feel like it tapers off a little bit as we go. I get several things knocked out of the way in the beginning so that way you can kind of like just knock it out, get it out of the way, and then it sort of evens out. Because a lot of classes, at least in my experience when I was in college, was the opposite. Like it started out really slow and then by the end of the semester you're like ah like there's just so much happening right like you have everything due you've got like project due and you've got like the final exam and you've got you know all of your assignments like piled up at the end and so I have found and the feedback I've gotten from a lot of my students has been that even though it feels stressful in the beginning it is really helpful near the end of the semester when there's less to do in my class because you have so much to do in your other classes now if this is your only class you won't feel that way. You'll just be frustrated with week one. But hopefully, if you have multiple classes going on this semester, it will feel a little relief and balanced by not having quite as much near the end with my class as you may have with some of your other classes. So um, for for all the syllabus that is posted prior to the beginning of the term, I received uh, reserve the right to make small changes prior to and during the term. Now, obviously, I'm not going to like change the game and like change the grading scheme or anything like that. But if, you know, something shifts with the schedule, if God forbid I'm sick, if there's some sort of like unforeseen emergency, like things can shift a little bit here and there, but you will definitely be notified as soon as that happens. Um, so I will definitely notify you guys by email through a Canvas announcement um, that changes are being made to any requirements or grading. So usually that only happens if I look at the syllabus later and I realize I've made some kind of mistake or there's some problem with, like I put the wrong date or something, or if I did the math wrong on like percentages. Um, that's usually the biggest change or a slight shift in scheduling. That probably won't be an issue for us since it is an online class. That happens sometimes when you're in the physical classes, like if, you know, a class lecture takes a little bit longer, the discussion between myself and the students, sometimes that can go long and it can put us off on our schedule. So that's usually the biggest time that there's like a shift in when things are going to be occurring from week to week. But with an online class, that's not really the issue. You guys will just be able to watch these videos at your leisure throughout the week. So um, I do work under the social sciences division, as I said before. Um, here is my work email, L Nixon Mabe, M-A-B, short for uh, Mabry for this, my second last name, at gulfcoast.edu. So because this is an online class, I am not on campus this summer at all. Um, so I don't have office hours. Like I'm, I'm doing, as you can tell, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing this all from home um, in my bedroom. We don't have like a massive home. So I don't have like an office, you know, every, all the rooms are taken <laughs> for living purposes. So, um, so I don't have like a physical location on campus to be able to meet if you need to, if you happen to live in Panama City and you're just not able to attend class. Obviously, if you're not local, that's not really an issue. Um, but I can set up Zoom meetings if you have questions. If you have something that you need to like kind of talk out face to face, feel free to um, email me, send me a message and we can coordinate our schedules and I can create a Zoom meeting at a time that works for both of us and then we can discuss that further and if you really really need to meet in person like there aren't a lot of people on campus but I can maybe try and coordinate something where we can like meet at a particular 
particular time, but really Zoom is going to be the guaranteed option that I can do because I am at home. I do have other things that I have to do over the summer as well. So it will be difficult to meet in person, but we can still meet face to face via Zoom. So if there is anything that you need that would normally be covered under office hours, we can certainly accommodate that and coordinate a time to do a Zoom meeting. Um, make sure to include your name in the course um, in the subject line for any emails. I ask that you don't send me an email like you're sending a text, um, mostly because it doesn't it doesn't always read well. It's not always clear. Um, Basically, I need to know who you are and the details of what your needs or concerns are. When people just send like a little short text, you know, we don't have that um, rapport with each other, right? Like we don't really know each other. So, you know, I don't know like your shorthand that you would send to like a friend or a family member in a text. So it just doesn't always come across well. So just send it you know, send a thorough detailed message and then we can go back and forth. It also saves time if you put everything in the email as opposed to like just a little short something that I have to like send a little short something to get clarification and then you have to send it and it just prolongs the process. And with such a short semester, you know, that's valuable time that you guys are losing if you need clarification on an assignment. And if you have a question, and we have to go back and forth four or five times, you know, that could be a two or three day delay depending on when I respond and when you respond. So, um, so it really is better to just make sure you're as clear as possible up front. So um, here is information if say there's an emergency, there's something going on and you don't reach me immediately, since I don't have like a phone number to contact me since I'm not on campus. Um, the chair for the social sciences division is Dr. Robert Saunders. You're welcome to contact him. Um, he does have an on-campus office. Now with it being summer, I'm not sure what his office hours are right now, but his office is room 211. It's on the second floor of the social sciences building. Um, you can also contact him by phone or email. Here's his email. Here's his office line with the extension. Um, and then the senior administrative assistant for the social sciences division is Teresa Vrabel. She can also help you. She's really great about like quick responses. I, I mean, they both are, but um, in case Dr. Saunders is in class or something like that, um, Ms. Rabel is great about a very quick and prompt response. And she can contact me like if, you know, if there's something going on, like she might be able to like call me or something and, and reach out. So, um, so her office is right next to his office. So room 210 and room 211. And you just call to this line and reach her. And then here's her work email. If for whatever reason, there's like a time sensitive matter. Um, I respond within 48 hours. Now during the week, I make every effort. I check it a few times a day. Generally, I check, um, you know, at least once a day. But I mean, when I'm teaching, I'm generally checking it three or four times a day to make sure that nobody has reached out to me and needed anything. So I try to check it really frequently, but uh, you know, things happen. I, maybe I'm in the shower, or maybe I'm asleep, you know, <laughs> whatever might be going on. So if there is like a time sensitive issue during the day or, or whatever, you know, like you feel free to reach out to either of them. So um, this is just a little bit about my education background to show um, basically my qualifications. So um, it's not listed on here because I just have like the top education, but I'm actually a graduate of Gulf Coast State College before it was state college. So my diploma actually says Gulf Coast Community College. Um, so it shows you how long it's been. Um, I actually graduated from Gulf Coast in 2007. Yes, I just had to look at my diploma. I have it framed up. I had to double check. So in like May of 2007. So it's been a hot minute since I've been at Gulf Coast as a student. And I know a lot of things have changed. Um, so I have my associate's degree in pre-communication, focusing on public relations and advertising. And then I went across the street to the Panama City campus and I got my bachelor's degree in professional communication, um, which is, you know, just obviously like more detailed, more like real world, you know, like your associates is just getting you ready for the next step. And then I moved to Tallahassee. Um, I took a, a little bit of time off, um, 
after I finished up, I took um, almost a year off from my bachelor's and then, um, and then I moved to Tallahassee and got my master's degree. So that's an applied American politics and policy. So the difference between that and say like just a regular political science degree is that political science degrees are generally theoretical so you can teach um, which obviously I'm doing but the applied American politics and policy um, teaches you real world applications for working within government entities to work on political campaigns in various fa various facets whether it be communication finances um, working on the ground you know that sort of thing or even running for political office so it's just a difference of whether or not you're planning on doing the academic route and i have worked in government offices which we'll discuss in more detail later on um, and i've worked on political campaigns and I've taught, so I've done uh, both sides of the coin. I've worked with Gulf Coast as an instructor since 2014. So, so I've been here for a while for that. Um, so I graduated in 2013 with that. I also have a graduate certificate and just preparing you for what's to come after graduation. Um, nothing fancy for that. So, um, so I'm born and bred in Florida from Panama City, obviously, and um, so I have a lot of experience in the communication side of things. So hopefully that'll make it easy for you guys to communicate and hopefully to understand me in the lectures. Hopefully I make myself clear as well as in this field that you're going to be learning about. So um, I've already gone over office hours. So just let me know, like if you do need to meet with me about something, um, might not be available during weekends and holidays just because, you know, yeah, we're off. Um, I do try to respond. I still try to check my stuff, like, you know, maybe not quite as frequently as I do during the week, but I still keep a checkout in case you do have a question on the weekend. Um, it just might not be as quick of a turnaround if I'm like tied up doing something. So, um, so you guys obviously we'll need reliable internet service because this is all online so hopefully that has already been arranged for you guys you guys already have that squared away um and obviously you need access to a computer because everything is going to be on, done online all assignments are going to be submitted online there's not like obviously any handouts or anything that you might would receive in a physical class so um so you just need to make sure that you have that um, if you have technical like problems, say you can't get logged into Canvas, it's got you locked out, like there's some sort of whatever problem that has to do with like the college's side of things, you can contact technical support. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week by calling this number. Now, um, sometimes you have to try a few times, like if they're tied up, you know, like in the evening, it might just be like one person answering the phone so like if you've got a problem at two o'clock in the morning like it might just be the one individual you know so um and then they're on campus monday through friday eight to four if you are in town and like really need to talk to somebody face to face so uh this is a three credit hour course it's a comprehensive exam of the theory practice ideals and realities of government and politics in the united states uh, major areas of study are behavior and participation, the legislative process, the presidency, the judicial process, and the administrative state. And so we'll talk about all of that ad nauseum over the next eight weeks. Um, in addition to your book, obviously, the Constitution is a fantastic um, source, and we will we will talk a lot about the Constitution because that's what obviously everything is based on in our government. So you'll. Uh, you'll walk away learning a lot more than you knew before, hopefully. So no prereqs for this class. Like you don't have to have taken one thing before you can take this one, which is good. So um, let's see, hopefully this is like large enough for you guys or that you can zoom in if you, if it's not, let me make it just a little bit bigger. So hopefully um, that didn't occur to me that it might be a little bit small. So hopefully this is a little better for you. Um, so there are certain things that you need to make sure that you understand from 
the learning from the lectures from the book, all of that um, throughout this process. So the successful experience for this course will result in every student being able to correctly describe, analyze, and evaluate the following concepts being demonstrated by student performance and written assignments, research, collaborative learning projects, objective and or subjective test questions designed to gauge and reinforce critical thinking and communication skills. So number one, you'll need to be able to describe and analyze the foundations and development of the US government by examining historical events that led up to the Revolutionary War, which we'll be talking about that in the first few chapters, the failure of the Articles of Confederation and evaluating the content of the US Constitution and its principles. Number two, discuss the political significance of civil rights protections and individual liberties in the US by describing the content and relevance of the Bill of Rights and other constitutional amendments and by applying constitutional principles to historical and contemporary issues. We will have next week so we're doing like chapters one two and three for week one slash module one and then for week two module two we will be doing nothing but discussing civil liberties and civil rights so that will cover so like week one really talks about a lot of what's in the first objective and then week two we'll talk about the second objective uh, number three, describe and evaluate the structure, roles, and powers of the institutions of American government, including contemporary policy, public policy making in economic, domestic, and foreign policy domains. And that's like throughout the rest of the book. And then number four, describe and analyze relationships between the people and the government, specifically the role of civil society and political processes like elections, and identify your own ideal, ideological perspectives. So again, like that's the entirety of the book as well. So we'll talk about like the background in the first week, we'll talk about civil liberties and civil rights in the next week, and then we'll be applying all of that um, throughout the rest of the the semester and three and four are basically throughout the entirety of the book. So um, there's a new um, state law that has been passed, new-ish. Um, it's called uh, 6A-10.02413-1. It's a civics literacy competency that the state of Florida has issued a requirement for. They adopted a new rule. Um, the previous civil literacy, civic literacy rule required all students to successfully complete either this course, Political Science 2041, or American History 2020. The new rule requires students to pass one or the other, and you need to achieve a passing score on a Department of Education approved civics exam, including the Florida State Civics Literacy exam. So if you were enrolled before this was passed, um, it's not a problem. But this says the new rule applies for students entering college the beginning of fall of 2021. So if you are a new enrollee from fall of 2021, which was two semesters ago, and forward, like if you didn't take any college classes before that, if you were not a like regular enrolled student, then this applies to you. If you are a regular enrolled student beforehand, and this is like one of your later classes you're taking, this does not apply to you. Um, and some people get confused about dual enrollment. So dual enrollment is not considered like a regular college enrollment. Like you're not considered to be a regular college student. Yes, you're taking college classes, but it doesn't fall under the same category. So you will have to do this literacy. Um, I actually had a dual enrolled student in the fall and he was worried about that, you know, and I got clarification. So, um, so he, he will be, and, and you would be as well if you fall into that category. So if you're continuously enrolled at Gulf Coast prior to fall 2021, you don't need to complete the exam. Uh, this does not, however, apply again to dual enrolled high school students. Um, so the Division of Social Sciences has created a preparation module for students wishing to prepare for the literacy exam. The module is housed within a designated Canvas page. You can self-register for the Canvas prep module via the following link. There's also a link within the module for you to register for the actual Florida Civics Literacy Exam. 
Um, one last note, the FCLE is not part of your grade for this class. It's an entirely separate item for your overall grade in your course. So there are four competencies that they're looking for with the state literacy exam. Number one is an understanding of the basic principles of American democracy and how they are applied in our Republican form of government, which we will be learning about. An understanding of the US Constitution, which we'll be learning about. Knowledge of the founding documents and how they have shaped the nature and functions of our institutions of self-governance which we'll be learning about, and an understanding of landmark Supreme Court cases, landmark legislation, and landmark executive actions and their impact on law and society. And we will be discussing some of those. Now, I can't guarantee that every single thing that we're going to talk about is going to be on the exam uh, and vice versa. I do highly, highly encourage you to sign up for this prep. It doesn't cost anything. It was built and designed by some of the, uh, like by our chair, Dr. Saunders, and some of the other instructors within our social sciences division to be able to help you prepare and succeed for this. And you have to pass this as part of your requirements to graduate with your associates. So one of the requirements you're handling right now by being enrolled in this class, and then if you've got friends who are taking American history, then they are doing part of the requirement as well, but you will as a newer college student have to pass a literacy exam. Now you don't have to sign up for this prep class, but it's definitely recommended because why wouldn't you want like the extra preparation? I know it's more work, right? Like obviously it's, it's more for you to have to do on your own time, but just like if you're studying for your classes, you're going to need to be prepared for this exam as well, especially since it hinges on you being able to like graduate. So I definitely recommend enrolling in this. If you have any additional questions about it or whatever, you know, let me know and I'll, I'll find out whatever I can. But so I definitely recommend signing up for this prep course if you are able to do it. So, um, so course requirements. So to when being enrolled in this class, you'll be required to watch the recorded lectures each week. So that will help you prepare because a lot of people, again, need that auditory learning experience. Sorry. <sighs> Read all of the textbook pages assigned in each learning module. Now, I say that. And we we've all been that student and I'm guilty of this too, who like doesn't crack the book and they don't do any of the reading. And maybe you're that student who can get away with it. Maybe you can just watch the lectures and you can do the assignments and you can like figure it out or you, maybe you can skim through the book. You know if you're able to do that as a student right like you you've gone through high school like you maybe held some jobs like you know what level of preparation you need to do for the class you should read the entirety of the book because if I miss a note in the lecture, like say I forget to mention something, it's in the book, you're still required to know that material, right? So, um, because I'm giving you a lot of information, but maybe there's an example that clicks for you that's in the book that I didn't say, or maybe there's something that I say that's not in the book that clicks for you. So both of those components are helpful. It is a lot of reading and I'm, a, and I'm very aware of that. So whatever works for you to succeed is your prerogative, right? Like I can't like, you know, I'm not your mom, right? I can't like, you know, watch over you and go have you done your reading. <laughs> but you really, really should try to make a solid effort to, to read the textbook that goes along, you know, with each thing. It really, um, it helps you have a better, like, well-rounded perspective of the material. Um, obviously, submit all assignments. That should go without saying, but you'd be surprised. Um, complete the final exam as scheduled. We don't have a final exam as in, like, a comprehensive, like, over the whole semester. We just have a last exam, but that would be considered the final exam. So that one needs to be done by whenever it's due because there has to be time to grade it to get it in for the final grade deadline. So, and we'll talk about that more later. Contact the instructor, does me, by email um, as soon as you have any problems or issues. I can't handle any problems unless you make me aware of them. So if there's a problem with, say I screwed up and I didn't open 
like an assignment on time or I put the wrong time for the deadline or say you're having trouble or you're not understanding something like the sooner I know about it, the sooner I can fix it or the sooner I can help you understand whatever you might not be understanding. So don't hesitate. Like I know not everybody is like a communications major. Not everybody is comfortable with communication or some people view it as confrontation. It's not confrontation, right? Like you're just, you know, you're just trying to make sure that you do well in the class. Like, so, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to me at all. Like I'm, I promise, like, I'm not, like, you know, I, I'm not, I don't bite, you know, like I am here to help you succeed. Like, that's my goal. I want everyone to be able to pass the class and hopefully I've built the course in a way that that won't be difficult for you. Um, but I can't help if you are struggling with something, if I don't know about it. Right. So, um, hopefully you guys already have your textbook. If not, you're definitely behind the eight ball a little bit. So the textbook for this class is We the People, 13th Essentials Edition. Um, here's the ISBN number. You can get it right from the Gulf Coast bookstore. Um, if you can't get to the college or their shipping's going to take a while, um, I know it has been for sale on Amazon. Like you can always look up the ISBN for that. Um, you can also like, here's the bookstore website. If you need to like order it, um, there's also an ebook version of the book that you can go directly to the publisher's website and purchase it as well. So this is, here's the link for that through Norton.com. So if that works better for you and you'd rather have an ebook instead of like a physical book, like that's again that's your prerogative whatever works for you so you can either get it through the college amazon um like physically at the college or through their website uh amazon is an option through the publisher there are a couple different ways if you have trouble finding a book for whatever reason let me know but i've not had any students have that problem so um okay canvas i've actually already had a student asked me about this. So you're supposed to automatically be enrolled in Canvas for the use of this class. So like when you enroll, you're supposed to automatically, like they're supposed to send you the details for like your Canvas account. Um, for dual enrolled students, I'm not sure if that comes to you from your high school or directly from the college. I would assume the college, but you know what they say about assumptions. So I don't know if it comes from the school, which school basically, I don't know if it's your high school or if it's the college, but you're supposed to automatically have that information given to you. Um, it's available through the college's main website. So you go to gulfcoast.edu. Um, if you don't know how to use Canvas, let me know, I can walk you through it. But technical issues like, I don't have a login. I never got anything or where's that supposed to go to? Is it my personal email? Is there like a school email? Like, what do I need to do? That is an IT question. So that's that phone number I gave you earlier for tech support. You can also email them, um, but you need to make sure that you have access to Canvas because the entire class is on Canvas. All of the lectures are uploaded on Canvas. All communication is through Canvas. Every single assignment is on canvas and will be due to be submitted on canvas all of your exams everything is on canvas so this is the holy grail and what you absolutely have to have to be able to participate in this class so if you don't have it or if you're having trouble with it please get that fixed that's like priority number one if you're having trouble let me know and i'll see if i can help in any way but like I would reach out to tech support first because they're going to be quicker because it's going to take me like reaching out to people and then get back, getting back to you. So I would be just like the middle person. So contact tech support if you're having trouble. And if you didn't get like a login, you would need to contact like who your point of contact person is, whether it be your advisor at the college or um, your point of contact person at your high school for the dual enrollment program, like whatever that case may be. Um, but you absolutely have to have Canvas. So it's imperative that you make sure to get that done. 
all class updates, assignments, quizzes, and resources will be posted to Canvas throughout the semester. So make sure to check it off. And I have this happen every semester. There's always at least one student, and it's usually a few who went, oh, I didn't see that email. So I, I didn't know about that. Like, and it's like, why didn't you check it? Like, I have to check it every day. You need to check it every day because it's a two-way street, right? Like, because you are in college, so you're you're acting as an adult by taking adult level courses. Therefore, as an adult, like it's your responsibility to check Canvas. It's not my job to hunt you down. So, and that goes for dual enrolled students too, because I like if we were in a physical class, I like I always give this the same little spiel as well. Like I'm I'm not the teacher who says, um, hey, like you need to ask permission before you go to the bathroom. I'm not the bathroom police. I ain't got time for that. You need to go, go to the bathroom, right? Like it's your time out of the classroom. Like it's up to you to be responsible about your time management. Like if you need to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. If you choose to stay gone for 30 minutes, that's 30 minutes of lecture. I'm not waiting for you to come back, right? And the same sort of thing applies like online. Like you, you're, you're an adult in my class. Like I, you know, I, high school rules, if you're a dual enroll student, like that, that doesn't apply here, right? Like you're a grown up and I'm going to treat you like a grown up. And I, I want you to be able to feel like you have control over your path in this class. And as a college student in general, because you do like this, it's, it's your future. Like you're not getting this degree for anybody else. Right. So, um, so make sure that you do the things you need to do to succeed. And one of those things is to check Canvas regularly. I recommend checking it at least once a day. If you have time, twice a day is great, but make sure that you're checking it every single day because um, I'll like, say I get an email from a student and they're having confusion and I clarify with them and I think about it and I'm like, you know what? I wonder if I wasn't clear enough maybe I should send this to everybody. And then I'll send like a clarification email to everyone like, hey, just want, you know, I got to thinking about it, you know, whatever, like whatever the situation is. Or maybe I hear from a couple of students that's the same similar like confusion that I know, ooh, like that, that fell on me. Clearly I wasn't as clear as I thought. So let me fix that. So you don't want to be the student who's missed out on necessary clarifications and information to be able to succeed, right? So you've got to make sure that you are checking your Canvas on the daily so that way you don't miss anything. Maybe you don't hear from me, but like once a week, whenever I send reminders of, hey, here's what we're doing this week, here's when things are due, um, but maybe you will. And so you don't want to miss out on that. I do go a step further than most college instructors. Um, I know life gets really busy and I know it's really easy to forget about like a random assignment or for, to forget when something is due. So I tend to reach out to people like two days, sometimes three, if I think about it, but usually two days before, like the students who haven't submitted stuff yet, like, okay, it's due like Sunday at midnight or 11.59 PM. And there's still two or three students who haven't submitted. I'll email those students and go, hey, just a reminder, you're not in trouble, it's not due yet, but it's coming up due, I just wanted to remind you. And then I wait a day and then I check to see if those students have submitted it. Whoever still hasn't submitted it gets another reminder, hey, it's due tomorrow. And then I check it the day it's due. And then the students who still haven't submitted, hey, it's due today, now you should be panicking. Like, you don't want to wait till the 11th hour because I can't help you at that point. You know, like I, like I'm not going to be too lenient on the student who contacts me at 1145. It's due at 1159 and you've just started on it. And now you're having problems with Canvas because you waited to the last minute to do it. And it's 1145. The odds are good. I'm not checking my email at that time. Right. Like I'm probably awake but I'm doing my own thing, right? Like I, like I have a toddler, like I, like she might be fighting going to sleep. Like I'm, I don't know, I might be like watching a late night show, right? Like, cause I'm an old woman and that's what I do. <laughs> so, you know, um, but I say all that to say, like, don't put yourself in that position because 
then you're in panic mode. You're not going to do as well on the submission. You're going to be stressed more about the time. So then you're going to Christmas tree it. And we all know that doesn't end well. And unless like you've got a true emergency that kept you from being able to do it in that seven day window sooner than, sorry, you know, um, I mean, it's one thing if it's like, noon on Sunday and you're like okay I've done all my reading I've listened to all the lectures I've done like the little things now I feel comfortable to sit down and like do the quizzes you know everybody's different if that works for you that's fine but if you're just starting on stuff and it's 10 11 o'clock at night you're you're putting yourself under pressure that doesn't have to be so I just say that to say build in whatever time, you know how long it takes you to do stuff. You know how long it takes you to read. You know how long it takes you to stop procrastinating, actually watch and pay attention to a lecture. You know how long it's going to take you to do what you need to do to succeed, right? So, and I am saying this as a professional procrastinator, okay? <laughs> like I am, I, I have been guilty of being that 1145 student. So I'm saying it out of experience. And I've had teachers who have been like, mm, an emergency on your part doesn't constitute an emergency on mine. Like failure to prepare on your end does not make me have to be in an emergency situation. And in the moment, I would be really irritated with those teachers. And then I'd have to have a little come to Jesus meeting with myself and say, well, yeah, I messed up. You know, um, so just make sure that you give yourself time to be able to prepare so you can succeed, right? So all class announcements will be found on the first page of the Canvas course under home, um, under the announcements, as well as a calendar and a quick email box. Um, click on, actually, I should have changed this, not on the assignment assignment section, you won't see that. You'll click on modules. So see, I've already found an error. So this should say, click on the modules section to find assignment details and other resources. So you might want to make a mental note, like, because the assignments doesn't show up, like you just go under the modules. Um, and then grades are available in the grade section. That is available. So um, student expectations. The student is expected to participate in the course by attending class when applicable for a face-to-face -face class, listening to and taking thorough no notes on all lectures, participating in class discussions where applicable, reading the assigned readings, and submitting all assignments, right? Like you guys have taken classes before, you know what you have to do in a class, right? So um, here is our current policy on COVID-19. I know we've all heard COVID more than we ever wanted to hear anything ever. Um, so we do have division policies. Now, some of this doesn't really apply. Most of it really doesn't apply because we're not face-to-face, -face, but for those of you who might have face-to-face -face classes. Um, so the health and safety of our students and faculty is a priority while on campus and in classrooms. Wearing cloth masks or disposable facial coverings is highly recommended and in accordance with the current CDC guidelines. Students and faculty must also practice social distancing when possible. If you're sick with COVID symptoms, please stay home to protect others. Now, obviously, like with being online, like you don't have to worry about staying home unless you've got a physical class. Notify your professor of your condition by phone or email. If you test positive for COVID, please inform the instructors to make arrangements for course requirements um, and contact Damien South, um, who's over our campus security and safety. You'll receive additional instructions from him. Um, and of course, your confidentiality will be maintained like we would never violate HIPAA with your health issues. So this information is subject to change. For the most recent information, refer to the college website section on COVID-19, which is here. So I mean, you guys are big boys and girls. Um, I'm not going to like read over the entire website. And what I uploaded of syllabus of the syllabus is the PDF. And so you should be able to access all the links without any problems. Um, I mean, worst case, like, you know, drag over it and copy it and paste it. But um, you shouldn't have a problem accessing the links through the PDF. So, um, so for us, that's not a big deal. Now, if you get, like, if you're, like, death's door sick, right, things happen, um, and I'll work with you and we'll do whatever we need to do. Now, if you're sick, like, the entire eight weeks, 
you know, like I, that's, that's going to be an issue in a couple of different ways. And obviously like each case is different, but um, if you're unable to do the work, like then you might would want to consider, you know, like taking it later, taking the class at another time, um, trying to submit as you can, see what you can get in to try and pass. Like it, it's kind of your own prerogative in that sense. And hopefully nobody is sick to that level. You know, I, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, but if it's just, you know, man, like I came down with the flu, like what, you know, like I, like I can't hardly get out of bed, let alone like do any work on anything, you know, like whatever, like get up with me and we'll coordinate and we'll figure out alternative deadlines and stuff if we have to. But um, please know that like if I hear from you like week seven and you haven't submitted hardly anything and it's, oh, you've been sick. I'm not really going to be able to help you at that point because I, you didn't contact me in enough time to be able to work with you. And I am not going to sub, like grade two months worth of work in a week just so you can pass the class. So you need to communicate with me as soon as possible. If you do get ill, if something happens, so that way I can help you and work with you. I can't help you when we're at the very tail end of things just because of time, right? Like, you know, I, I, I wish I had a DeLorean, but I don't like, so I can't go back and like build more time into something. So just make sure that you communicate with me as quickly as possible. So um, you guys, if you've already taken classes are pretty familiar with this statement. If you're not, um, you will be. <laughs> so um, the college's academic integrity policy, honest participation in academic endeavors fosters an environment in which optimal learning can take place and is consistent with the college's mission. Academic misconduct, including cheating or plagiarism, is destructive to the spirit of an educational environment. Social science professors report every instance of student academic misconduct to the college for inclusion on the students' records. Cheating includes, but is not limited to, use of an un unauthorized assistance of completing coursework. Plagiarism includes, but is not limited to, the use by paraphrase or direct quotation of published or unpublished work of another person without full and clear acknowledgement which in other words, citations, as well as the purchase of papers or projects. Self-plagiarism occurs when a student submits the same or considerably similar documents to fulfill requirements in a different class. For example, if a student submits a term paper in religion class, they originally wrote for an English class, that's self-plagiarism. Once the paper receives a grade in one class, it cannot be submitted again for another class. Sanctions for incidences of academic misconduct, depending on the severity of the incidents and or its repetition, may range from receiving an F on the assignment or test or activity to failure of the course to suspension or dismissal from the college. So the college takes this very seriously, as do all of the instructors. So, like, don't think that you can outsmart the instructors who've been doing this for a long time, you won't and it won't end well for you. I've had students try it and it does not end well for them. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. And so I, I've seen just about every trick in the book. Like it, there's no sense in risking your academic future just to be lazy. Cause that's what all of this is, right? It's just lazy. It's not taking the time to do the work correctly. So um, on plagiarism, it's really simple. You always cite the person whose thought you're portraying in your assignment. Like proper citations are vital, which I will go over in more detail when I talk about the writing assignment that you have um, for the discussion board research on voting. Um, I will talk about that in that particular video. So we'll go over that in more detail in another video. So I won't dive into it here. But it is imperative that you cite things properly. And if you don't know how to cite, you learn it really fast, okay? Because you have writing assignments in most of your classes in some way, shape, or form. Some teachers are more lenient about it. Some are not. I am not. So it, it's important. You don't steal other people's work, plain and simple. Um, so we actually have a way to run assignments through a database to compare and make sure it's not been submitted anywhere else. So um, to just don't be that kid. 
like or that or that adult like you know I, I don't know you know I know I've got some dual enrolled kids I know I've got some you know older students I'm sure as well so just don't be that person like you don't want to get caught up in that I had a student who like I kept telling her in her like rough drafts like you're not citing here's what you need to do I walked her through it I showed her exactly what needed to be done she still submitted it incorrectly and I she failed the assignment and she was already doing poorly in the class and by getting a zero in that assignment I was very nice because I didn't like I let the college know in case she did it in future classes but I didn't like just kick her out of the class for it but she messed herself over because she was already not doing well in that zero she failed the class anyways so one zero especially if it's for a large assignment and this was for a research paper yeah it can make or break you so you just don't want to be in that situation um i had another student who tried it and swore up and down that he didn't do it but he did like he copied his brother who was also in the class which is like really <laughs> like i'm not going to realize that i've just read the exact same thing twice so um and people who have been teaching for a long time can tell like when a person's writing voice changes when all of a sudden wow like they like this was all sounding like the same person wrote this and now all of a sudden it sounds really different i don't think this is their work and that's that's what happened initially with that other student who failed was that i copied the section that didn't sound like her and her writing and i i literally plugged it into google and it was right there she just didn't cite it i was like i like i beat this over the head multiple times like like i talked about it and talked about it talked about it so it's it's important that you take that very very seriously so um because all teachers do so it it'll be a problem if you if you don't take it seriously so um student accessibility statement gulf coast state college supports an inclusive learning environment for all students if there are aspects of the instruction or design of this course or any course for that matter that hinder your full participation reasonable accommodations can be arranged prior to receiving accommodations you must register with the student accessibility resources center appropriate academic accommodations will be determined based on the documented needs of the student for information regarding that registration process email saw SAR at gulfcoast.edu, which is for student accessibility resources, or call them here, 747-3243. So this, this applies, say you, like I'll give myself as an example. So when I was in graduate school, I was diagnosed with ADHD, which is like super late. A lot of the time females are not diagnosed as easily as males because it presents a little differently. It's not usually the same sort of like rough housing, might just be like a chatty Cathy sort of situation or you know something along those lines. So I was just always seen as like a talker, right? Like, and just excitable. Um, and then when I got diagnosed with ADHD, I got like an accommodation packet where it says, hey, like she gets distracted she takes a little bit longer to like read she needs additional testing time and then that gets put on file with the college and then each instructor has to follow that and they get notification from the school saying hey they're required this extra amount of time i also had the option to test in the testing center if i didn't want to test like in um in the classroom with you know everybody else because of all the distraction so so maybe you have something like that like I, I know at the grade school level it's referred to as like an iep a lot of times so like that can follow you to college that's something that you can establish at the college level as well and if you've never had anything like that but you're like well i like i was actually diagnosed with add too but i've never had that be an issue like i had no problems like multitasking, waiting to the 11th hour to do everything until I hit graduate school, because I work really well under pressure when I have too much to do. I'm actually more productive, which is it's an ADD thing. It's ridiculous. Uh, but all I did was go to school and I worked on a political campaign. So I wasn't as busy as I had been when I was working a 40 hour a week job and I was like president of a couple of clubs at Florida State and I was taking a couple classes a semester. 
and I found myself drifting and I couldn't focus. And that was it, like the snowball effect that taught, that got me like, I, like what's wrong with me? And, you know, and I got the diagnosis. So, um, and so I needed that extra help at that time. So for a lot of people, like they're fine in high school and then like college is another level that they're not really prepared for. And they do need that extra help. It doesn't hinder you. All it does is help you. Like if, you have that and you get it registered with the Student Accessibility Resources Center, they send me the information and say, hey, you have this student this semester, they need like time and a half. So say you're allotted an hour for an exam, well, now you get an hour and a half. Or this student doesn't need as much time, which I've actually never had, but it can be where like they need half time because they otherwise they can't focus right okay instead of an hour they get 30 minutes and so I change you know like the the schedule for that right I change the clock um same with quizzes like okay you get time and a half if a quiz is 15 minutes well now you get like I throw on seven minutes because you can't divide 15 evenly so I just like do the roundup instead of six I do the seven so you get like 22 minutes so if you already have something like that, make sure that it's registered with the resources center so they can let all of your instructors know so that you get all of the benefits you need. And if you don't have something like that, but you feel like you should for whatever reason, whatever it is that you might have, it's not just ADD, like there are a million different things that might be something that you, you need this for, right? Definitely reach out to the resources center. You have to be the one to reach out. Like I had a student who wanted to sign up for it, and, but I couldn't, like I had to be like, look, you have to deal with them because like, it's a privacy thing. Like I can't say, hey, this student needs this. You have to say it. So make sure that you reach out to them if you have something and you need to get it established with the college, or if you need something and you need to get established, they have like testing to like, to see what sort of help you might need. There's, it, it's a whole thing. So don't hinder yourself by just like sucking it up. Like, do, like don't, there's no need to torture yourself. Like take advantage of the resources that are available to you if applicable. So recording lectures. So here's a new thing that's also come down from the state. In accordance with federal and state privacy laws, students may record class lectures for their own personal education use. Now, this mostly applies for face-to-face -face classes because obviously this is a recorded lecture already. But if you're in a face-to-face -face class, especially like you can record it if you need to go back and like watch it later. Um, in connection with the complaint to the college or as evidence in internal or external legal, legal proceedings, students may not publish or upload the recordings or any components thereof without the knowledge and written permission of the faculty member. So like you can't record a teacher and then post it to YouTube to like, complain is the nice word <laughs> I was going to say something else to complain about that teacher right like oh, I hate this person they're awful blah 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 like you know or oh this teacher always dresses so frumpy like you know look at what they do like you can't you can't do that <laughs> unless they approve of it which I, I don't know anybody who would like voluntarily approve of that so um or like Facebook or right like any public source so um Failure to obtain permission to publish could lead to the students having to pay damages, attorney fees, and court costs. So it could be a costly error in judgment if you do. For more information about what can be recorded, please see the guidelines on pages 36 to 38 in the Gulf Coast Student Handbook, which is linked right here. So um, I've already kind of gone over this, but real quick, email and voicemail, which doesn't apply here, response time, instructors will check and respond to messages sent to their Gulf Coast email within 48 hours during scheduled work days, barring personal illness or emergencies. The instructor may not check email during holidays or weekends, which we actually, the only holiday that falls during our eight week class is the 4th of July, um, but it's literally one day the college is not closed for the week or anything so it doesn't really apply you still have assignments due that week. Just feel free to not work on them on Monday, <laughs> the 4th if you don't want to. Um, so this applies to messages also sent by canvas as well as any voicemails left on a provided number should you have one for an instructor. So attendance, regular class attendance where applicable and participation are significant factors that help to promote success in college. In face-to-face -face courses, students are required to be in class at the beginning of each class session. 
as attendance will be taken at this time. If a student arrives late, it is his or her responsibility to inform the instructor after class of his or her presence, because it's not the instructor's job to go, oh yeah, I saw them come in, let me make sure to mark it. Failure to do so may result in a student being marked as absent. Attendance in an online or hybrid Canvas class is divine, defined as submission of completed written assignments prior to their posted deadline. Um, and we'll go over that a little bit more here shortly. Withdrawals. I will, before I read this off, I want to start off with a caveat of be really careful when you do withdrawals because they hinder your progress towards graduation. Like they can hurt you with like your student aid, with any sort of financial aid you receive. Um, you're usually only allowed like so many for a class. Um, it, it just slows you down and it doesn't really look good on your transcript. Like if, if this is all you're doing, like if you're just going to school for the two years and you're totally done and you know it without a shadow of a doubt that you're not doing anything else, then do you boo, okay? But if you're going across the street to Florida State or you're going to West Florida, are you, uh, sorry, go Knowles. <laughs> Wherever you're going after Gulf Coast, they're gonna get your transcript. If they see a lot of withdrawals or a lot of like Fs, then like they take it again and then they get by with a C or D. Like those are some of the things that like the college's admissions departments look at as to whether or not to admit you into their schools. Now, Gulf Coast and Florida State have a really great partnership about admittance into future programs. They're like, they kind of consider each other like sister schools for the Panama City campus. So it's easier to get in there, but it's not like a guarantee. You still can't like screw around, right? So you just don't want to put yourself in that position. So um, when I was at Gulf Coast, I made a lot of errors along the way. Like I knew what I was majoring in, but I had a lot of personal things like happen right before I started college. And I just made a lot of dumb mistakes. Like I signed up for tap dance class as an elective and I dropped it because I like couldn't pick it up. I felt like I do left feet. Like I can dance, but apparently not like that. So, um, and then I took like a math class that I found out later I didn't even need for my program, but I thought I did because I tried to take it in high school and failed. It was algebra. Turns out when you have a communications degree, they give you like made up liberal arts math. So you don't have to take real math because you're not good at it. So um, there were a lot of stupid things that I did so I have like a lot of withdrawals and obviously I was still able to like succeed. I went on and got my bachelor's and my master's, but those continual errors also negatively impacted my GPA. I graduated with like, I think it was a 2.6, which is just sad and embarrassing. And it took me four and a half years to get through Gulf Coast because I'd take a class and then I'd drop a class and then I take two classes and fail one or I take a semester off because I was I was just floundering because I didn't reach out to my advisors or my teachers, which was my fault. Like I should have been like, hey, I'm struggling. What do I need to do? And I, I just didn't. I felt very, very lost. Um, so let that be like a lesson. Reach out to your advisors, reach out to your teachers. Don't be afraid to ask questions. So that way you can succeed because this is a different level. You know, like in high school, they're, they're always kind of on you, following up making sure you're doing what you're supposed to do. The guidance counselors are constantly checking stuff. Nobody's doing that for you now. So you have to make sure that you're doing it. Otherwise you're gonna just screw yourself over in the long run. So students may withdraw themselves from any course until the published withdrawal deadline from that particular term in the Gulf Coast State College catalog. I do not know what the withdrawal deadline is for this term. I usually look it up and I just didn't think to. So, I mean, if somebody needs to know, I'm sure I can look it up, but so can you, like you, you can Google it and, and, you know, and find it, look it up on the website. Um, usually it's pretty quickly after like classes start, especially with these short semesters. So um, a lot of times it's like, well, a drop ad is usually pretty quick, but like the withdrawal is usually like halfway or something through the semester. Um, so you have time on a withdrawal, but like drop ad is pretty fast. So um, 
students wishing to withdraw from a course and receive a W must complete a withdrawal form and submit it to the Office of Enrollment Services prior to the scheduled withdrawal date as published on the college calendar. Social science instructors, of which I am, do not withdraw students from their individual courses under any circumstances. Used to way back, like a form could be submitted to the teachers and they could do all of that, but there were a lot of errors, things were done wrong because that wasn't like really our forte, right? Like we weren't part of enrollment services. So like a lot of mistakes got made and then financial aid would get messed up and stuff. So it's just been removed to where we don't, we're not responsible for that. Like you have to go through enrollment services. If you feel you have a unique situation that warrants removal from all your courses for a term after the withdrawal deadline is passed, you can contact the vice president of student affairs to discuss your situation. Like, okay, withdrawals passed, your mother passes away, or you get in a terrible car accident or you get really, really ill or like something unforeseen where like you can't even remotely like focus to try and get through the last of the semester, then like reach out to the vice president of student affairs to see if you can get a special withdrawal. I've had students get like spe spe special like medical withdrawals. Like I had a student who was trying their best, like they ended up getting COVID and then long COVID and they like, they could not get better. And it was in a shorter semester and they were like, I, like, I, I think I can get it done. And we were at the very end of the semester and there was very little that they had been able to do. And the college was like, they just need to do a medical withdrawal and it won't hurt them like a regular withdrawal. It's just better to try it again later. And so in a situation like that, like, don't torture yourself, right? Like if there's a true, like nothing you can do about it situation, then by all means, reach out to the school. Um, but be very careful with withdrawals because two withdrawals are permitted per class. So say you take this class, something happens or, or you hate me or you're not getting it or whatever, and you withdraw from the class, all right? That's your first withdrawal. And then you take it again, and you're in a car accident or whatever, right? You can't finish, that's the second withdrawal. The third time you go to take it, you have to take whatever grade you get in the class. So you have to be careful, very, very careful with withdrawals. Um, because the last thing you want is like the three strikes and you're out rule and you've just kind of messed around about classes. I, my best friend actually has that situation where she's having to like take a class like out of state because she has done the three strikes and you're out rule with Gulf Coast basically for a particular class. She just kept messing around really and just didn't take it seriously. And now she's gonna have to pay a lot of money to be able to finish that class that it's one of her requirements. So just be very, very careful. Be concerned about withdrawals. When admitting students into certain programs, universities may calculate withdrawals as grades. It is your responsibility to verify the effects of enrollment and or withdrawal upon your financial assistance for financial aid, scholarships, grants, et cetera. So be very, very, very careful about withdrawals. You wanna take them very, very seriously.
So incomplete grades are um, grades of any incomplete in social science courses can only be assigned to students who have an emergency arise during the last two weeks of the course. So like, I can't give you an incomplete if like we're, you know, into week three or four and you're like, oh, I think I'm not gonna be able to finish the class on time. Like it has to be like a true last minute emergency. To receive an incomplete, you have to submit a written request um, to the instructor for me prior to the last face-to-face -face class meeting, if applicable. For online classes, a written incomplete request must be received no later than the week before the final exam period begins. So that is like the week of like August 1st through the 5th, I believe is what it is. <sighs> Sorry, situs is the spring is not my friend. Um, so those are the only like ways that you can request. Um, so ha you have to have completed no less than 60% of the course requirements and you have to be passing the course at the time it's submitted. So like you can't be like you can't have like an F and submit a request and then you know be able to like complete it later so you have to be passing the class and you have to have completed at least 60 percent of our course requirements um the incomplete option gives 30 days from the date grades are due which is like the 6th or the 7th or something of august um are due to make up any missing work if not if work is not submitted during this period the grade will automatically be changed to an f in lighthouse so used to there was like more wiggle room and it just kind of stay that way until the student got stuff done but that is no longer the case so if you can't get it done in that 30 days then it gets changed to an f like i had a student i don't remember if it was in the fall or if it was one time last year or i'm not really sure um who like had some medical stuff come up and they were doing really well in the class um and it's a it was like a full four month class and in my long class i have a large project like not what i have assigned for you guys but it's much more in depth for them to work on over the course of the four months and um and she hadn't done any of it yet and she hadn't like there was like one i think one or two exams near the end that she hadn't done but she had done everything else so like i approved her for an incomplete and i kept like following up with her and following up with her to try and get that stuff in because I knew she only had 30 days and it was I think it was in the fall because it was like right before the holidays and she never got me anything and she was doing well in the class like and because she had had medical stuff throughout the semester like I'd worked with her and I was really flexible on her schedule and I just hate it because she was doing really well and it wasn't really any fault of her own like she was just dealing with things outside of her control but she didn't really want to do a medical withdrawal and and if she could have gotten that last few things in, she would have needed one. So um, it, I just hate it when things like that happen. So, um, you know, because I like I, I can't just give a grade like, I, you know, I have to have something to back up that grade, obviously. So, um, I mean, if I could just like give it out like I, I you know, I would because she she was a good student, but you know, that wouldn't be fair to all the other kids who put in the work. So, um, so if you have like a true situation that warrants an incomplete, great, you know, then we will do what we need to do. But you can't just get an incomplete because, you know, you just ran out of time, you didn't budget your time well, it has to be like, a, like a real emergency, like some sort of real situation that warrants needing that. So just be aware of that, like, um, try and manage your time the best you can to not get yourself in any kind of situation where you feel like you're not going to finish. All right, grading and assignments. So this is like, now we're kind of done with like the generalization of like college policies and stuff. And now like we're talking specifics for how to pass this class, which let's be real, it's all, it's what you've been waiting for. You don't care about the other stuff nearly as much as you do. Like, what do I need to do to get in and out and make, you know, a good grade in this class? So the course is based on a scale of percentages by section. The assignments will be weighted as follows. So you guys have 15 quizzes. It sounds like a lot. 
but I mean, I guess it is, but, but, but it's not when, cause it's like, it's doled out over the eight weeks, right? Like you don't have 15 quizzes due in a week. Right. So your first one is a syllabus quiz, which is based on this video and what we're doing right now. So, um, so that's like your first one, like you watch this lecture, you go back and review the syllabus if you feel like you need to, and you take the syllabus quiz. I do require that you make an 80% or better on the syllabus quiz, because then that way I know that you understand the stuff in the syllabus, because this is sort of like your contract between you and I to know what my expectations are and what my requirements are to like to help you succeed and then what your expectations and what your requirements are. So I need to know that you are clear about those important details. So um, it's, if you pay attention to this lecture and you go back and look over the syllabus, it should be super easy to get that 80. It's not a big deal. I think there are 10 questions and you've got 15 minutes to do it. So as long as you are like familiar with syllabus, like you probably won't even need that full 15 minutes. Um, the two general quizzes I discussed in the welcome email to you guys, one is a U.S. citizenship quiz. It is not a U.S. citizenship test. It's not like a real, like you could be deported if you fail it or anything like that. Uh, the Washington Times put it together oops, several years ago where it's just some basic information and some basic questions that are like on the citizenship test to see what your basic knowledge and understanding of American government and politics, politics is starting out. So and it's like pass or fail. So you complete it and you get credit. You don't complete it, you don't get credit. So it's really simple. You go to the link, like, so I've got it, you know, listed in the module under that quiz. You um, go to the description, you click on the link to the Washington Times quiz, you take the quiz. When you get to your results, you screenshot it. Hopefully most of you know how to screenshot. If you don't, reach out to me. I don't want to bore everybody with instructions on how to screenshot for those who do. If you don't, let me know. Like, of course, things vary by if you're doing it on your phone or a tablet or a computer. Um, a lot of people use the, um, there's like a clip feature on most computers where it looks like scissors and you can like drag, like, like select that clip tool, do like a new clip, drag around the screen and then it'll it'll save it and then you can save that image like on your computer or your tablet or whatever and use that as your upload for your your submission for your assignment like i'll need to see like the completion of that and try and make sure you've got like the the timestamp on it you know like whenever you do your page make sure it's got like the date and the time that you completed it um so that way I know that it wasn't like after the fact or that it's the exact same as your buddy who's also taking the class and you didn't do it, but they did like, because the odds of somebody having the exact same date and the exact same time for that quiz are unlikely. So make sure you have the date and time um, in your screenshot. So so that's the first one. And the second one is a founding father quiz that's through the US Constitution Center. And so just like before, like it's complete or not complete, like pass or fail, you click on the link in the assignment, you answer the questions. It's just to see like off the top of your head, like what you know about our founding fathers. Um, and then you get you know, your results, you screenshot it, same as before, make sure the date and time is in it, um, and then attach it, um, like, as, like, as an attachment for the document, you submit it, and as long as, like, I've got that image, then you get full credit, and if you don't, you don't get any credit, so, so those first three quizzes, easy easy lemon squeezy like there's no prep in the two general quizzes and the syllabus quiz like I said watch the lecture and review your syllabus and you should be golden the rest of them are chapter quizzes so you'll have a quiz for each chapter of the book except chapter 12 which is the bureaucracy chapter and a lot of that's because it gets in it's a very in the weeds sort of chapter there's a lot of like 
nooks and crannies and details that like it's something you need to know about and it's something that we'll talk about and it's something that will be like tested but the quizzes just don't go well so i so i just don't quiz on that particular thing um and then you won't have quizzes for chapters 14 and 15 because those are the last two chapters we go over in the last week before your final or last exam and the exam is over those two chapters so it doesn't make sense to me to quiz you on it and then immediately test you on the exact same material so i'm not going to do that for those so but you have it for chapters 1 through 11 and chapter 13 but not 12 14 and 15. so um so that's 25 percent of your class grade 10 percent of your grade is participation now obviously i can't do like traditional attendance because we're not face to face so participation like it said earlier on in the syllabus for an online class is submission of your work if you submit 100 percent of your assignments you'll get the full 10 percent if you only submit you know 50 percent you'll get five percent so it depends on the level of completeness for your work like if you have all your assignments you ain't gotta worry about it but like it starts whittling down based on how much you actually submit. So just keep that in mind, right? So that should be an easy 10% as long as you submit all your work. Um, and then the research assignment and responses, the assignment itself, like what you're doing, your research, your essay that you're submitting, that's 25% of your grade. And then the responses that you're going to do with your classmates is another 15% of the grade. So, and again, remember, I'm going to have a whole separate video going into this assignment and detail. So I'm not going to bog us down with that here. I'm just going to focus on like the general like course introduction. So, um, and then you'll have five exams. So the first, well, actually I'll go over that in just a second. I have like a whole little thing in the syllabus. So five exams over the course of the eight weeks, 25%. So you add all that up and you get to a hundred percent. So Gulf Coast grading scale, 90 to hundred is an A, 80 to an 89 B, 70 to 79 C, 60 to 69 D, 59 and below F. So we don't do like A plus and A minus like you're used to in like high school or whatever. Like it's just A or B. Like you get an 89. Sorry for you. Right. So here's how I do my class. So final grades will be rounded up, but only if it's a 0.5 and up and will make a difference in a letter grade. So say so the way I grade things is I do it, you know, like if it averages out to where it's like an 89.49, I put in 89.49 in that say individual quiz grade. Okay. Like I do it out by, by two after the uh, decimal point. So say after all of your grades are entered, the average ends up being an 89.5. I give you an A because that's how math works i don't know a lot about math it's not my strong suit but i do know the, the basics so 89.5 to 100 equals an a in my class you get a 79.50 to an 89.49 a b if you've got an 89.48 89.49 don't come and ask for an a it's not going to happen sorry um because i have to have a cutoff right like i can't just give it to you and not give it, it can't be subjective it ha there has to be like a clear line in the sand so um a c is a 69.50 to a 79.49 a d is a 59.50 to a 69.49 and anything 59.49 and below is an f so and that's the only roundup I do. I don't round up each assignment because then that's not like a clear, you know, like if I round up for everything, then it softens and cushions your grade. So I don't do that. I only round up on what your final grade is. So you either earn it or you don't. So, you know, if you're like, oh man, like I have an 89, like, is there anything I can do for that last point? 
no, sorry. Um, I do have some extra credit that I will be sprinkling in throughout the semester. I have to look at what I normally do and see like what we have time for. Um, so like that may help you like if you bomb on one of the exams or something and you like want to try and help cushion that somehow then like extra credit is a good way to do that but I won't be issuing it like at the very end as a last ditch effort for somebody to do well in the class like take advantage of it as it's available throughout the semester and you know and that'll help cushion it but I won't be giving it at the very end for people um so it will be available um and then it'll be again graded exactly and not rounded up so um and so it'll either help or it or it won't so um so i just have to that's one of the things i'm going to do this week is look and see like what applies to the semester and what doesn't um if you would let me know if you live in panama city or not like and if you have a way to get to physical locations because a couple of the extra credit assignments i have um <coughs> sorry um like one of the things that i have is to go to like the bay county like publishing museum that's downtown and another one is like the bay county historical museum and so if everybody lives in panama city then i feel like i can offer that and if not like i do have an um an alternative option for that for people who like can't physically go um they have like online interactive stuff for both of those and so i can so i can do something like that and they're really educational and they like connect to the area um the historical museum has some really great stuff on one of the things that ended up being pivotal for civil rights and it happened here in bay county so um but again I, like i'll talk about that more in detail later so it, like just let me know if each of you could let me know like if you live in town or not it just helps give me an idea of like the kinds of things i can get creative with for extra credit so assignments below is a list of all assignments that have to be completed for this class including the dates the due dates for each one they correspond with the grading rubric above and may also be found in the module section in canvas be sure to make a note of each assignment and its due date to ensure on-time submissions of each assignment please keep in mind that all due dates and times are based on central standard time zone because that's where the campus is located in panama city so if you're on eastern time like just remember Remember that central standard time is an hour before you guys so like right now it's it's seven o'clock on sunday in panama city but it's eight o'clock in tallahassee so just make sure that you're aware of that when you're submitting times so um it is based on central time so um which actually helps if you're like in Eastern time, really like, oh, it's due by 1159. Well, that's like, you know, almost one o'clock. Like if you're in Eastern time, don't don't wait till then to submit it. But, you know, it does kind of give that like mental buffer. So make up work policy. If you foresee difficulty of any type, illness, employment change, et cetera, which may prevent completion of course requirements, notify me as soon as possible. Requests for extensions must be made in advance and accompanied by appropriate written documentation to receive full credit. Any work submitted after its deadline will receive a 10% penalty per day after it is late unless it's excused and I give you other instructions. This extends to a maximum of three days at which, at which time late work will not be accepted. So example, for regular assignments, each assignment is due on Sundays at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. So if you don't submit it and you get up with me and you're like, oh my God, like something happened, like, or whatever. Like I can work with you if I know about it ahead of time, right? And this 10% can be subjective. If you just simply forget, you know, like you get part of it done, you fall asleep, you wake up and you go, oh crap, <laughs> I missed the deadline, right? That happens, things happen. You can reach out to me and say, hey, cause I also, I close out the assignment. So I like, you won't be able to submit it if you miss it. So like it locks 
after that 1159. So if you miss an assignment and you want to try and make it up within that three day window, you have to contact me and then I can go in and open it up for you specifically. So that way it's not open up to the whole class to like redo the assignment. So you have to reach out to me and then I can reopen it and say you don't submit it on Sunday, but you submit it on Monday, you only lose 10%. You submit it on Tuesday, you lose 20%. You submit it on Wednesday, you lose 30%. You try and submit it on Thursday, too late, no go, it's a zero. So try not to put yourself in that situation. Try to not even have to worry about the makeup policy. It's less work for me, it's less work for you guys, it's less stress all the way around, right? So, um, I mean, things happen and, you know, people forget and, you know, and that that's perfectly reasonable, but um, this helps keep you guys on task and it helps prevent me having a ton of last minute like work that has to be graded, especially in such a short semester. Like it's incredibly hectic, like, you know, it's a whirlwind eight weeks and I have to have those grades in like I like I can't be late on that. So I have to have all of your submissions on time. So. If I've not heard from you by the deadline date for the exam, no makeup work is allowed unless extraordinary circumstances exist, like hospitalization or natural disaster. Requests for extension must be made in advance and accompanied by appropriate written documentation. Computer problems is not an acceptable excuse. I don't want to hear, oh, I got kicked out of Canvas. Well, when were you logged in? Oh, I, I logged in in plenty of time. You should be aware that all college instructors, at least for Gulf Coast State College or anybody who uses Canvas, can actually go in and see when our students last logged in to Canvas. So if you told me, oh, I, I logged in at seven o'clock and I was working diligently on everything, but it shows that the last time you logged in was like 10, 11, 12, like, no. Like if you logged in at 11.50, and then you're upset because it kicked you out like that's on you like that was a failure to plan appropriately so just keep that in mind like that will not be like a valid excuse um so it's subjective it's at my discretion as to whether or not i allow makeup it depends on the reason um and please don't please don't try to lie or make up any BS because um, I'll know, right? Like, I, I mean, I've done this a long time, like can't BS a BSer, right? It's a phrase like, like I've done it before. I have a BS in communication. So I'm very aware um, when somebody is not being upfront about things, just like let, like, let me know. Like, I don't mind like reopening it if something happened or you just like didn't plan well, like, you know, like I, like I'm not unreasonable, but I'm also not going to be taken advantage of and do it every single week for every single assignment. Like, like there will be a cutoff. So just be, be cognizant of your time. Okay. So participation, I expect you to participate in class through timely assignment submission and being prepared. The class is what you make it. And this sounds really lame and very nerdy and very teachery of me, but American national government can be interesting and exciting. I try to make jokes. Sometimes it comes across as mom jokes. Sometimes people won't think they're funny. Sometimes they're not very like timely, like maybe you're too young to understand the joke or, or whatever. Um, but I try to make it as entertaining as I can, especially since Really, I'm in a room alone talking to myself since we're not like live with each other, right? So be ready to learn. The 10% participation will be based on the percentage of assignments you submit. So we already talked about the quizzes, the 80% for the syllabus quiz um, and all of the other ones. So all quizzes are due by Sunday, 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time of the given week that they're due. Um, discussion board. Florida has its statewide midterm election this August. I'm assuming most of you are Florida residents. If you aren't, please let me know, but I'm assuming most of you are probably in Florida. Um, and if not, then like, we'll, we'll just talk what you're, what is best for you to do for this assignment. So you'll choose a race that will be on your ballot. I'm hoping that you are all registered to vote. 
I will also be discussing how to register to vote if you are in the separate video about the discussion board. And I'll talk about the importance of being registered to vote, when you can pre-register if you're not 18, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but hopefully you guys are. And being that this is American national government class, I will definitely be politely harassing <laughs> and explaining like why it is so, so important to be registered involved in our political process. Um, you'll write about the position that you choose, what it does, and compare the can candidates who are running this year. Um, a rubric will be provided. It is not published yet because this is a brand new assignment. You guys should feel special. So because we only have eight weeks, the assignment that I usually do for everybody is hella long and really big. Um, I have you choose a founding father and like you do a resume about them. You do like... Um, you, you write a like it, it's just a whole thing it's like a really long i won't even go into a lot of detail because it'll just confuse you guys but there's not time to do this well i actually tried to do it in a shorter semester and it was a nightmare for everybody so i will not subject you guys to do that so this is a new assignment so i've not created the rubric yet that will be up at some point this week and i will email you when it is ready nobody is going to be ready to finish this assignment this week anyways so breathe don't panic i know there are those of you who are like but i have to know i have to get started on it now focus on the reading of the chapters that you need to do for this week focus on the syllabus quiz, the two general quizzes, and chapters one through three in their quizzes, because you have an exam on it next week, which we're about to go into detail. So that needs to be like your big focus, and then like regroup and think about the discussion board in more detail next week. That's like my best advice for this. So, um, okay discussion board responses so you'll need to respond to at least three classmates initial posts with thoughtful feedback and i'll have a rubric for the responses as well um so the five exams that i talked about each exam will be due on a wednesday at 11 59 of a given week so this week we're doing chapters one through three next week you will be testing like mut like so all this week is chapters one through three next week you will have um monday tuesday wednesday opportunities to take the exam on chapters one two and three i've had some students tell me that the word exam freaks them out for me the word test always freaked me out and i don't know why i'm not a good test taker by nature and if i had a better way to like judge y'all's um, understanding of the material. I like I would do it differently, but I don't, especially since we're an online class. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so if exam freaks you out, ignore the word exam and replace it with test or quiz or assignment or survey of your understanding. Feel free to call it like a survey in your head. Like, oh, she's just surveying me to see what I what I remembered. Whatever makes you feel better feel free to use that. But for purposes of the class, I, I'm just using the word exam. But um, if that makes you like break out into hives and have a panic attack or whatever, feel free to like substitute it with something else. So chapters one, two, and three are the first exam. So if you've looked at your book yet, you'll see that your exam, or I'm sorry, that your book is broken into four sections. Part one is foundations. Part two is politics, part three is institutions, and part four is policy. So part one is huge. It's five chapters. And chapters four and five are in civil liberties and civil rights, which is a ton to take in all on their own. So I've broken up part one into two exams. So part one is chapters one, two, and three. And then part two of part one is four and five, which will be in a few weeks. Um, part two will be chapters six through nine. Now, yes, that's four chapters. However, um, a lot of the material is easier to get. They flow really well together and it, it all kind of like plugs in together. So it makes sense to test them together. And 
you'll you'll see as we go along. It it won't be as overwhelming as the others, in my opinion. I, I mean, who knows? Like you might see that totally differently. Part three of your book is institutions. So that will be also four chapters. Now, these are hefty chapters, and I do apologize for that. And I would be able to break it up a little bit better if we had a longer class, but we don't. So um, Congress, presidency, bureaucracy, and federal courts. They all do go together, though. So hopefully the flow doesn't make it feel overwhelming, OK? And then the last one, which is the last week of the semester, part four is policy, and that's domestic and foreign policy. Obviously, that makes sense to put those together. So I have them grouped by like subject sections, so that will make it easier for your studying purposes. And remember, aside from chapters 12, 14, and 15, you will have quizzes. When you finish the quizzes, like you'll have a better idea of what it is that I'm looking for you to understand. You'll see some of those questions almost verbatim, again, not all of them, but some of them, again, on the exam. So it's like a pre, it's a pre-test. Think of the quizzes as like study guides for each chapter. And then I will also be giving you actual study guides for the exams. So, and I'll have it broken down by chapter. Like you need to know this from this chapter, this from this chapter, this from this chapter. So with the quizzes as like a precursor and the study guides, it will hopefully make the exams, tests, surveys of your knowledge, whatever you want to call them, much more easy to take a bite out of, right? Like hopefully it will make it where it's not as overwhelming for you. All sections of the course require each student to take a final exam. The final exam, um, ah, this is wrong too. This is from a face-to-face -face class. So um, the final exam will not be in class. It will be online and it will cover chapters 14 and 15, domestic and foreign policy. So we're at the very end of the syllabus. Woohoo! Yay! Okay, so I have it broken down by module, which is also the week of the class. So you'll have eight modules. Let me make sure that that's correct. Yes, eight modules uh, for eight weeks. Okay, so module one, and then I have the date. So hopefully that'll help you to be able to follow along. Um, so I have like kind of what we're focusing on for the week and what your actual assignments are. Now it looks like a lot, but if you notice, part of that is watch the course introduction video. So that's like homework, but it's not like an actual, like you're just watching it, right? You're not having to do an assignment with it. Um, reading, I also have like what you need to read as part of your assignments. So, um, and then I have when you need to have that work done by in the due date. And then I provided these handy dandy little check boxes for you, for those of you who need like that focus like if you want to print this off and you want to say okay i've watched the course introduction video check Whew. one thing down i've read the syllabus check okay all right now i'm going to take the quiz check right like if you if that works for you like that might not be something all of you need you might be fine with the canvas reminders and stuff and just following along that way and whatever works for you but this is like an extra little bit for you or if you're super fancy and you have like adobe fill and sign you don't even have to print it you can just like fill and sign it and then like check it off <laughs> as you're doing it um for those of you who are super fancy um but hopefully this makes it a little easier for you to keep track of. So you'll see like module one, course introduction, which we're doing, syllabus review, which we're doing, um, instructor intro introduction, which I'm going to do in a minute, um, the research assignment introduction, which is in a separate video, chapters one, two, and three, also separate videos, and then the Washington Times and Constitution Center quizzes. Um, and so then I have it laid out to watch the introduction video, read the syllabus, take the syllabus quiz, take quiz two, which is that Washington Times quiz, because that'll make you feel like, OK, I'm really getting it done now. And there's no pressure for it. As long as you submit it, you get full credit. So um, and then I have it listed to watch the discussion board uh, video, um, watch the chapter one video and lecture, read um, chapter one, take the chapter one quiz. 
So if you do it in that order, then it'll be fresh in your mind. Then watch the chapter two video. Cause so you don't want to watch this video, the discussion board video, and then three chapters. That's five videos that are really long of me rambling about the things you need to know, right? It's a lot. Like, um, so this will help break that up where you're not just watching video after video and then don't remember what needs to be done. So if you do it in the order that I have it, it'll help break it up and it'll help you retain the information you need before you actually take the quiz. So read chapter one, take chapter one quiz. Chapter two video, read chapter two, take chapter two quiz. Chapter three video, read chapter three, um, take chapter three quiz. And then I also have here, take name that founding father. I probably should have put that higher up. I think I messed up on that. But like, if you need a break in between stuff, go ahead and like, maybe do one of the online quizzes, do a couple of chapters, do an online quiz, do another chapter. And then you're going to study for the foundation as exam. I will get you guys the study guide in the next few days, but I don't want to bombard you with too many documents all at once because this is a heavy first week. So I don't want anybody panicking. I don't want like people shaped holes through doors where they're like, where you're all having breakdowns. I don't want a bunch of withdrawals because I don't want you guys to panic. Like it's, it's all good. This seems like a lot, but it's not as bad when it's broken down by sections. All right. So just everybody breathe. If you feel like you're panicking, feel free to email me. It, it's all right. I promise. So once you've gotten through all of that, and really, if you think about it, this isn't really a whole separate thing, the studying, because you've just been doing that, right? Because you did chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And if you're an overachiever, there are study guides at the end of each chapter. And I'll show you those whenever I do the chapter lectures as well. Um, so you can always do those study guides and like check your answers um, with the chapter. And that also helps you study the material as well. For those of you who have time, like that's gonna be a lot, but some people find that to be really helpful at the end of the book. So, and then week two, the first thing you're gonna do is the first exam on chapters one, two, and three. And that'll be due on the 22nd, which is Wednesday after next. Um, and then you'll do the chapters four and five, and then you'll study for the next exam. And then the following Wednesday will be the second exam. And then you get a little bit of break on the exams. Like the next week will be chapters um, six and seven. And then the week after that is eight and nine. And then the week after that is exam three. So, so it's heavy the first couple weeks. Then it's just doing the work and you get a little break. Um, and then, you know, you've got chapters 10 and 11, 12 and 13, and then the fourth exam. And then you have to have chapters 14 and 15, and then that last exam. And that'll be due that Wednesday. So the semester technically closes on August 5th, but grades are usually due like that next like Saturday. So like August 5th is Friday, grades are due by Saturday. I need to have everything in in time so I can get the grades submitted into Lighthouse, which is the final official record. So that also gives time if there's somebody who's been approved for like submitting something late or whatever, that gives plenty of time for that to happen. So, um, so the exams are due on Wednesdays of that for of whatever Wednesday they're due. And then quizzes and any other assignment, it, which the only other assignments is the discussion board will be due on Sundays. So the discussion board, the initial discussion board, the essay that you're gonna do that the video, the other video will go into detail on is gonna be due by the midway point of the semester. So that's module four, that's week four. So that's exactly halfway through the semester. So July 10th. So that is 4th of July week. Yes. So, so the week of 4th of July. So 4th of July is on a Monday. The Sunday following that um, is when the initial part is due because there needs to be time for it to be due for one, for me to grade it. Cause it's going to take a lot. Cause it's, this is actually a large online class. So I have to be able to grade all of them. And two, 
all of your classmates have to have time to kind of like peruse through the submissions and pick who they want to respond to. So you need time to do that. So, so it'll be due at the halfway point. And then the responses from everybody will be due the week before the final week of the semester. So July 31st. So the initial responses are due on the 10th. And then let me look at the calendar real quick here. If I can find the actual calendar, here we go. Um, okay, so July 10th, and then the responses are due on the 31st. So that's one, two, three more weeks. So you'll have four weeks to do the discussion board initial assignment, and then you'll have three weeks to respond. So if you do like one response a week, you'll have all your stuff done. Right. And also, because that's a lot of responses I have to read, I have to have time to do that. So that gives me like all of this final week to grade basically your last project, your last portion of the assignment. So, um, so hopefully the way I have this laid out makes sense for you guys as to what you need to do and when you need to do it when it's all due by. Um, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So this is this is your lovely syllabus. This is what we're looking at for the next eight weeks. So usually, like I mentioned at the beginning of my video, um, usually I do like instructor introductions and then I do student introductions. But you know, since we're not face to face, can't really do that. But I always like to do like a little introduction about myself, just so you know, a little bit about my background and basically why I do this because I've had a lot of people be like, ugh, teach, ugh, why, <laughs> you know? Um, and a lot of people just don't understand, especially the topic. Like people either are really fascinated by American government or government in general, or they're like, what a snooze fest, or ugh, like all politicians are liars. And like, they just kind of like cut it off, right? Like, so, um, so a lot of people just go in going, why in God's name would anybody volunteer to do this? I mean, I'm not volunteering. I get paid, but you know, instructor pay. So it's not, uh, you know, I'm not rolling in it. But um, so like I mentioned before, I'm from Panama City, born and raised. I went to mostly high school, graduated in 2002. Um, that was back when it was just like Rutherford, Mosley, Bay, and Arnold like Bozeman hadn't even been built yet. So like all the kids that are like Bozeman now, we're all going to mostly at the time. So, um, and then I started Gulf Coast and took me four and a half years to get through Gulf Coast. And then I went across the street, took me three and a half years to get through Florida State. Um, I finished almost all of my work in two and a half years, but I actually had a car accident and ended up in that weird, like incomplete stage of needing um more time to finish work and that was back when you could just take your sweet time on it <laughs> and so it took me another year to like stop messing around and get it done I like which is looking back I could just smack myself but so I walked the stage in 2010 but my diploma since 2011 so procrastinators anonymous right here <laughs> um and then so I basically like took a year off and then I moved to Tallahassee in 2011 and actually like stayed on topic there. I took two classes this semester, finished my master's in two years. Um, I had actually wanted to move to DC, but spoiler alert, DC is hella expensive and they don't pay you bupkis. So it, like you either have to have family money or be willing to I don't know, sleep in your car or have 10 roommates or whatever. And I just was not about that life because I was older. Like by the time when I finished my master's, I was like 29. And, you know, they, they, a lot of times they want you to start out with like unpaid internships and stuff. And I'm like, I'm not like 19 or 20 or 22 years old or something. Like, like I'm almost 30. Like I, I have bills <laughs> to work. So, um, I mean, I actually like flew up and met with some people over a couple of days and like uh, some of my teachers like helped set me up with like interviews and stuff and but I, I was just like this, it's too much money like I can't afford this and unfortunately it's a lot of people so um so I actually got a job 
back in Panama City because this town will suck you in, right? Like it's so hard to get out. It's like quicksand. Um, and so I moved back to Panama City when I finished um, college because I couldn't really find anything that I wanted in Tallahassee. Um, so before I moved, um, like I've held a lot of jobs, like a lot of people, right? Like I worked retail um for a number of years and then I got hired on at the supervisor of elections office here in Bay County and I worked there for five years from July of 2006 to August 2011 when I moved to Tallahassee which is the only reason I left and I actually tried to get on with the supervisor of elections there but they basically didn't want to work with my college schedule even though it was all night classes or whatever so um so I did that for five years here. I did voter registration and I did projects for the community for community voter registration and outreach. And I was in charge of the vote by mail ballot process, which I'll talk about in more detail when I talk about registering to vote in a separate video. Um, so I did that for five years, loved it, absolutely loved the process, got involved with politics uh, at the same time, um, worked on some campaigns in my spare time, helped somebody, like I wrote their like speeches for public venues and I created like their campaign brochure and their slogan and, um, and I did consulting on other ones like, um, and that was all like at the local level, like for mayor and uh, like city commission, state representative, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then when I was in Tallahassee, I worked on a presidential campaign and then on like kind of like a community action campaign that followed up after the election. And then I came back here and I got hired to work for a radio station as a, like account executive, so sales basically, like trying to sell ads, sell ads. Um, and I love the writing part. I love the creativity. I love meeting people, but I hated asking people for money, <laughs> which is not how you make money in sales. So it wasn't like a good fit for me. And then I ended up working for the uh, Bay County School District for a couple of years. I taught at Bay High. I taught American government and US history. Um, and I worked as like a paraprofessional teaching intensive reading and math for students who needed like extra one on one time, which I've always like been passionate about. Um, so I did that for two years and I worked at Margaret K. Lewis for a little bit, which is probably one of the most challenging things I've ever done to. Um, it was just a world that I hadn't been immersed in before um and the students were just incredible and it, it was uh it was one of the hardest things i've ever done but one of the most rewarding as well and then i um needed to make more money <laughs> because paraprofessionals don't make a lot of money and um i got hired with the panama city rescue mission to do their communications i was their communications manager so like social media like tv interviews um creating events graphic design creating any of their mail pieces i like all of that stuff like you you know when you work for a nonprofit and you do the communications it's a catch-all you do the website and the social media and like large companies like you get hired to do just one of those but when you work for like a small business or a nonprofit, you do all of them for very little money <laughs> um and so i did that for almost two years um and then i some things happened and then I wasn't working there anymore. Um, and I might go into that later when we talk about some other government stuff. Um, and then I got hired to work for Two Men in a Truck as their communications manager um, here in town. And I got offered the position the Friday before Hurricane Michael. And Hurricane Michael happened, you know, so the apocalypse hit Panama City. And then it was over a month before I could actually start because like our home was destroyed. We had to go and evacuate for like three weeks to Pensacola because we had nowhere to live. And then we lived in a shabby, awful RV for eight months as a lot of people had to do after the storm. I mean, it had like mold and it was like my in-laws and it had been in storage and it was a hot mess. Um, and then we bought our home in 2019. Um, 
and uh, COVID happened um, at, well, back up. So that was in two, June of 2019, we bought my our home. October of 2019, I got pregnant with my daughter. Uh, February of 2020, everything started getting shut down because of COVID. So I, you know, you hear those stories about people going, oh, so you had a COVID baby. Like that was my experience, you know, like no visitors during appointments, only one person at the hospital with you masks. That was a mess. Um, so business started to struggle because of COVID with two men in a truck. And so they had some layoffs. I got laid off a month before I had my daughter. So that was a hot mess. So I decided to like not even look for work until like my heel time, my maternity, all that was up. So then I worked for a real estate company as their communications person for a little over a year. And then we had kind of like that second wave of COVID where like businesses took another hard hit. And I got laid off again due to budget cuts. Ugh. So, and I'm sure a lot of you have like similar stories. Like it's just been a hot mess. So I've done a lot of communications work and a lot of election and government work. Like, and I've done like elections in between and communication stuff, like, and they've crossed over a lot. Um, I headed up a large project when I was getting my master's to honor like a former governor who has now since passed away, Ruben Askew. I was the like head for that particular project project and um so I've had like a lot of crossover like with my communications experience and my political experience um and so since that last layoff um I, and this whole time I like I've been teaching right like I, since 2000 and what I what did I say 14 2014 I've been teaching at Gulf Coast and my husband and I also have like a consulting LLC for like communications graphic design website management he does IT so kind of like a little catch-all of some different aspects of that and so we do that um, and so just kind of a little bit of everything but um having been here my pretty much my entire life minus two years in Tallahassee and I was still home a lot um you know I'm just familiar with a lot of the folks here in town um and what caused me to actually want to go into American government and politics was kind of just this crazy whirlwind of things that happened to my dad actually um so my dad served during the Vietnam era in the Air Force. Um, at that time, you either waited until your number was called and you were drafted or um, you like voluntarily go in. So you feel like you have like some kind of control and what branch and maybe like your MOS, like what job you do, that sort of thing. So he decided he would rather enlist in the air force than like risk being called up and maybe going to the Marines or something or like, it, it just into a, an area that he wasn't as comfortable with. Um, so he, he signed up for the Air Force and he did four years um, in the Air Force. He never actually served during Vietnam. Um, he was stationed at Eglin Air Force Base. For those of you familiar with this area, that's between here and Pensacola, basically between Panama City and Pensacola. Um, and he did a couple, you know, little odd and end jobs and things during his time in the Air Force. One of the things that he did, they have testing ranges at I think pretty much all military bases where they like test equipment and they test to see how things are doing and making sure things are doing the way they're supposed to do and so he worked on those testing ranges where um they would have flights that would fly over the ranges and they would drop what they call ordinances like canisters of like materials and they would test to make sure that things exploded properly and all of that um and my dad was one of the people who like cleaned up the ranges like at the end of the day like he'd pick up the canisters and that kind of thing um so years later fast forward it turns out that what they were testing at that time on those ranges was a chemical called agent orange now some of you may be going oh god like some of you are very familiar with agent orange especially if you're from this area and you're of a certain age for those of you who aren't agent orange was a chemical that was created during 
the Vietnam era and used in Vietnam, they would drop it from the plains um, onto like the jungle vegetation because it just like ate away the vegetation and cleared the, the land so they could see the enemy easier because we were at a disadvantage because we weren't familiar with the terrain. And so the opposition, you know, had a leg up because they were familiar in the jungle where, well, warfare in a way that we were simply not. So Agent Orange was created as um, a workaround for that. So before they sprayed it over there, they tested it at a couple of different places here in the United States. Eglin was one of those places. So, you know, they created it with the goal of killing, you know, multi thousand year old vegetation. Um, but the people that were working with it, they didn't give any protective gear for. So if they think it's going to kill like a thousand year old tree, what in the world do you think it's going to do to like a 19, 20, 24 year old, whatever soldier cleaning up an area? Um, so my dad ended up getting sick when I was a kid. Um, and before it was all said and done, he had been diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma bone cancer, skin cancer, bipolar disorder, which there's some evidence that says he probably had that before, but it was exacerbated by the Agent Orange, um, and an enlarged spleen. For those of you who don't know, um, your spleen, when it's not broken or defective or not working right, is about the size of your fist or the size of a lemon, all right? So pretty small. My dad's had been filling with toxic blood as a result of his exposure to Agent Orange. And by the time they realized it, it had grown to the size of a watermelon full of bad blood. Hopefully you guys are eating while you're listening to this. If so, I apologize. Um, they actually thought it might be a world's record, but it was just short of like a couple inches because they measured it. Um, because my dad like looked pregnant all the time. We just thought he was just because he wasn't exercising. Um, but it turns out it was because of that. And it had stretched his belly out so much like he had hernias like down the middle of his stomach as well. Um, and the doctor had said, had he gotten hit in the stomach and it ruptured, he would have bled to death. If he had been across the street from the hospital, he would have bled to death before he could get any help because that's how bad it was. Um, so that happened. And they didn't catch his bone cancer until it was in the fourth stage. My mom always says that there's actually five stages of cancer, um, not four. And the fifth one is death, which is a pretty good way to put it. Um, he had to go through 12 rounds of chemotherapy. He actually went into remission. Um, but obviously that's aggressive. Like that takes a toll on your body. He had had skin cancers removed before they knew anything else was wrong. He had worked outside a lot. He'd been a carpenter. He had his own landscaping, like lawn care business. So, and, you know, like didn't wear sunscreen like he should and, you know, that kind of thing. And he smoked and, you know, he just did things that like weren't healthy for his body anyways. So he just chalked stuff up to that until he found out that he was sick with other things. So... The only way that he even knew what had caused it was he was at a soccer game of my brother's and another dad was in the stands and they started talking and the guy said, so when did you serve in Vietnam? And he was like, what are you talking about? I never served in Vietnam. He's like, really? Because your arms look like they've been eaten up by Asian orange. And he, cause he was talking and then he told him about the skin cancers and that he'd had cancer and stuff. And so they started comparing notes. Turned out this guy was a VA rep. Like he helped people get disability and he served during Vietnam. And it turns out that anybody who worked on those ranges at Eglin Air Force Base was exposed to 10 times the amount of Agent Orange as anybody who actually served in Vietnam. Like they got sicker than people in Vietnam, which is like hard to get your head around, right? 
So he actually started working with him and contacting old buddies and getting paperwork together and photos that people had kept that they weren't supposed to take and paperwork that people had held on to. And they were actually able to gather enough evidence to prove that Agent Orange had been sprayed and tested on those ranges and that people had been exposed to it and they had never been given any protective gear. They weren't told what was there or anything like that. Um, the News Herald here, our local paper, actually did two news stories on my dad's case. Um, and I actually have those newspaper articles and I have them scanned in. So I'll actually, because it's so like, this is so old, this is like 2000, 2001. And so, you know, they scrub their website. So after a while, it's not on there, but I have the article scanned in. So I will actually like upload those for anybody who's interested in seeing it. Um, so between like the exposure from the news story um, and from all of the evidence, they were actually able to take my dad's situation to court and prove that he was exposed to Agent Orange on U.S. soil to get 100% service-connected disability, even though he'd only served four years, which is very difficult to do. He was actually the first person to win his case, proving that in the United States. Um, and he won his case. He got his back pay. Um, my mom got some benefits. My brother and I got like a little bit of money for school. And I mean, like a hundred and something dollars a month, like not like if he had been 20 years, like he didn't get all of those types of benefits, but like where my mom could have like, um, like a military ID to go on base and he could, and he got like social security disability and then like B VA stuff. Um, and after everything was finalized he kept saying he was going to win his case and he'd be dead in a couple of months and of course we were like oh you're being so dramatic like it's fine like you're in remission this that and the other but he like the doctors were saying that he was losing blood um and it turned out it was because the chemotherapy did so much damage to his body that his body could not produce enough blood. So he started having blood transfusions and he would have like two a week and it just wasn't doing anything. Um, and he thought he was starting to feel better. Like he could feel like he had feeling in his feet that he hadn't had in a while and this, that, and the other, but the doctor was like, that's not what these results are showing. You're not getting any better. Um, and he died exactly three months after getting his disability um and it was by passing blood like when your body starts shutting down from not producing enough blood it like tries to expel the rest of it which is a crazy concept right like um it, it just seems very backwards you think your body would want to hold on to it so um so for those of you who are familiar with anyone who's ever had bipolar disorder it's not pretty for those who don't have it managed well. And my dad was one of those people. He didn't want to take his meds regularly. When he took them, he thought he didn't need them anymore. Or he think my mom was trying to drag him up or, you know, he like, he just couldn't have the emotions he wanted to have. And uh, bipolar disorder just lies to the people who have it basically. And so it's a constant battle to get people to take care of themselves appropriately. Um, and my dad had a temper by nature um had problems with his drinking um because he was in a lot of pain too and so as he got sicker like the bipolar disorder got worse his temper got worse he and i got to where we didn't get along things got physical a couple of times um it was a really bad situation and i'd gotten to the point where i would like ask the universe to be like look like either something needs to change where we get along better or for the love of God, just like take it because I like, I was a teenager at the time, you know, and teenagers deal with their own mess. And, um, and I was 18 and I was miserable because he always targeted me, um, for a number of different reasons that I won't go into, but, um, so we fought constantly and things just got really ugly and really bad and dangerous. And, um, and it was just constant. And I was just at my wit's end. I was actually planning on joining the military just to get out of the house. And then I ended up having a lot of health issues and 
wouldn't be accepted. But um, so like we we weren't on really great terms. And the night that he passed, we were in the ER with him and he was unconscious. And you know, we were told you need to say your goodbyes. And my mom and my mom's mom and myself were there. And my brother had actually left to go get like our best friends who lived down the road. So he wasn't there at the time. And so like my mom said goodbye, my grandmother said goodbye. And then they looked at me and I was like, I don't no, I'm not doing it. I refuse to say goodbye. Um, and I said, you know, he's the most stubborn SOP on the planet. And he fights about everything and he digs his heels in about everything. And now he's just going to quit. He's just going to give up. Like, no, absolutely not. No, I'm not going to say goodbye. He needs to fight. And I, I was mad. I was angry that he had the gall to die, <laughs> which is crazy when you think about it, you know? And I was like, you know, who's going to be there when like, he's not going to be there when I, when I graduate college. So like he died in August of 2002. I graduated high school in May of 2002. He died the night before I signed up for my classes for Gulf Coast. And or the morning, like Sunday morning, and we went and signed up Monday. So, so that was the personal stuff I mentioned earlier that like kind of started things out on a rocky note. So, you know, all those things that you think about when you're losing somebody that you are expecting to be there. And so I'm talking about, you're not going to be there to watch me go to college. And, and that was part of the reason why you fought for your disability, because you wanted me to be able to go to school and you wanted to see me do that. Cause I've talked about wanting to go to college since I was in kindergarten and you're not going to be there to watch Robbie who's my younger brother like graduate high school you're not going to be there when we get married who's supposed to walk me down the aisle who's going to be the grandpa to my future kids like you're not going to be there for any of that you can't go like who the hell do you think you are um and I'm at first I'm telling all of this to my mom and my grandmother because I refuse to look at him and he's unconscious at the time and they turn me around to him. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm like literally shouting at him. Like, you can't go because you, you have all this stuff left to do. Like, you're not done. And when I got done saying everything that I was feeling, and I stopped, and I took a breath, and I just started crying, of course, um, he flatlined. And my brother walked in the room at that time. So he has a lot of like unresolved, like I didn't get to say goodbye issues. And, um, and I have all of these pent up issues of, you know, us not getting a chance. I always assumed when I moved out of the house, we would have a better relationship. Um, and then I didn't get that until like, you know, that's young to lose your parent, you know, 18. And my brother was 16 at the time, 17. Um, so. And then I had a lot of conflicting feelings because while I was sad, I was, a lot of people look at me like I have two heads for saying this, but I was relieved because we were not in a healthy situation in a healthy household and our entire lives revolved around him and his illness and when he was going to have his next bipolar episode and was it safe to sleep that night and it was bad. It got really bad. And so I was relieved to be done with that aspect of my life and to to not have that chip on my shoulder lo and behold that's not really how that works and i found myself picking fights and arguments with other people and i'd be very defensive and i was constantly looking for the next time somebody was going to attack me and so i had a lot of like personal like and like looking in to do right and to try and move on from that and i found myself talking to somebody about my dad's situation and how I really felt like our family got screwed over. We got gypped and by the government. Um, and I was angry. I was so angry about it. And I was just, just like, you know, this, this isn't right. Like, this isn't fair. There should be some sort of accountability. Somebody should do something like this isn't fair that like we lose our dad and in some ways lost him way before we lost him because he was, it was like Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde. You never knew what you're going to get. And 
and whoever it was I was talking to, I don't remember now, said, well, who's this they you keep talking about? Who's they? Who's the they that needs to do something? I said, you know, the government, like the government officials. And they were like, well, they're the ones that like screwed it up. I was like, I know, but they should be able to do something. And I was like, they, me, you, us, all, all of us, like we're the they, we're the ones that put them into office. We're the ones who can kick them out of office. It's up to us to put the best quality people in office so the next person that comes along hopefully doesn't care more about lining their pockets from a corporation that develops something like Agent Orange without thinking about the lives of who it negatively impacts. And that became my mission, my like life's mission to tell as many people as I could about my story and about my dad's story and about the fact that government is only what we make it. By, based on who we put in charge to make those decisions. And we can't choose the right people to go into office unless we understand government and politics and the ins and outs of the workings of our system. And so it's up to us to be responsible, right? We have to be responsible voters. We have to be responsible citizens and register to vote and to be engaged and to be knowledgeable about the system itself, the people who are running for office, what their platforms are, what they're looking to do and making sure that they reflect what we as a society want. Now, doesn't make it a perfect system, right? Because what one person's ideal government is, is not somebody else's, but it's still a better system than like just one, you know, dictator or something, right? Or, um, you know, like what, we're seeing from Russia right now, like at least our system does have that give and take and there is repercussion for poor actions of people in, in leadership. Um, you know, no system is perfect, but the more people who are engaged, the more people who are knowledgeable, the more people who are educated and actually show up and vote the better off we're all going to be because we're going to have a larger say. It's not going to be just the small percentage of people who usually vote. If more people turn out to the polls and more people don't just blindly vote for the name they saw the most on the street corner or whatever, they actually did their homework, we would have a better system. And it has been like my life mission since then to make sure that people are as knowledgeable as I can make them about the way our system is designed and the real world complications and implications and the politics and how it all marries together and what we have to be willing to do as citizens to make our system the best it can be. Because if I can tell my story and my dad's story, and my family's story, and I can make one person, one more person look up and go, holy crap on a cracker like that's that's insane I had no idea our government did something like that to our people I had no idea that that occurred because they buried it um lo and behold a lot of those health issues I mentioned that keep me from joining the military research has shown it's directly because my dad was exposed to agent orange I have um I have an autoimmune disease. I have several, several health issues that make it difficult for me to work in a traditional setting on a regular basis. And it's all been linked back to the fact that my parent was exposed to Agent Orange before I was conceived. Um, and then the government shut down their research so they wouldn't have to pay out. So when our government doesn't do the right thing by their people, People die, people get sick, and people's lives are forever negatively impacted because we didn't have the best quality people to make the right decisions when it really counted and to make the morally sound decisions. So for me, it was imperative that I do what I can for me for my personal beliefs, my personal political beliefs, to do what I could to put the people that I felt were best in office and to teach people to do the same. I'm not gonna tell you what my personal political beliefs are. I'm not gonna tell you 
you know, if I bleed blue or red or green, right? I'm not going to tell you my personal beliefs. It's this class is for you to figure out your own ideological beliefs. My job is to teach you all the ins and outs and to show you the system that like you can only see so much of in grade school because they have a lot of restrictions on like what they talk about, right? In a way that the college is like, it's a little, it's more open um, for you to become more knowledgeable. So you can decide for yourself what is best for you, your family, your loved ones, and for society as a whole. And you can't do that if you're not educated about the situation. If you're not informed about our system and how it's designed and how it works, how can you possibly go into the voting booth and make a good choice? Um, one of the things that I also am going back and doing this year, in addition to the fact that I teach and I have my own business and, you know, run a house and that sort of thing. Um, I'm going back to the elections office and I'm working on the other side this this year. So when you go and vote, there are poll workers who have the poll location open. They're the ones who do the work. They're the ones who issue your ballot and make sure the machines are running and making sure that like everything flows and that you can do your thing at the voting site. I did that one time before I actually got hired at the elections office, I worked one election. And so I decided to go back and do that again. You get a little bit of pay, you're not gonna get rich on it, but it's another way to like participate in the process. And so, because I have so much experience and so much time working at the elections office too, um, they were excited to have me back to be able to do that and to be able to help. Um, it's also something that you can sign up for you can contact them and sign up for it if you're registered to vote. Um, you can fill out the registration form and mark that you're interested in being a poll worker and you can reach out to them. They are looking for people. I will go into that in more detail in the discussion board video where I will also be talking about the voter registration form. Um, but keep that in mind. I will talk about it in more detail later. Um, so I, I just, I'm always looking for ways to be engaged and to put my money where my mouth is. I can complain about it all day long, but if I'm not actually taking action, then I'm as bad as anybody else, right? So that's why I do what I do. Um, and that's why I'm here. I, I love teaching. This is this is one of my favorite things to do. And it's the same subject every semester. In some ways it's the same sort of stories, but the people are always new. You guys are always a different group. And um, and then as new things happen in politics and government, there's always new to add to it, right? Like it's all it's ever evolving and ever changing. And so um, I just love it. I love doing this. I love working with you guys. I think this is important work. I think it's really, really vital. Um, so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to teach with you guys. I'm excited to work with you for the next eight weeks. Um, I hope that you're excited to um, hopefully learn some new things. Maybe you did tonight. Um, if you have any questions about the syllabus or our proposed schedule or anything like that, um, feel free to let me know and I will clarify anything that's needed. Um, this is your first of several videos this week, but hey, look at that. You're one one out the door. So you do that, you refer to the syllabus again, and you should be able to knock out your quiz. And that's one of six quizzes you have this week. And then if you knock out the online ones, you're halfway done. So um, I'm excited to see you guys or see you guys this week and, and the semester. Um, and I will talk with you soon. Thanks so much, you guys, and have a good night, okay? Talk to you soon. Bye.